In this module, I want to give you just a, a very a brief and high-level introduction to material science and, and kind of tell you what, what the focus of it is. So let's, let's, let's begin. It actually encompasses, in this case, sort of four different um, uh, uh, stages, I guess, if you will, or steps. Uh, the first is processing, and I'm showing you here uh, uh, somebody uh, putting metal into a furnace, and then in the next image, uh, it's it's taking that hot metal and dunking it into an oil bath. So that's just an example of processing. So material science is is fundamentally interested in the processing of materials, specifically uh, for what the processing does to the structure. So if I do, in this case, um, a heating and quenching of a metal, for example, what happens to the structure and why? So in this case, I'm showing you here... Um, in these images, uh, you can see that this is an atomic arrangement. So these are this is actually a, um, a high-resolution electron micrograph of uh, or microscope image rather of, of an atomic configuration. Those the atomic configuration itself can be impacted by the processing, as well as the arrangement of what are called grains. We'll talk about that uh, later on in this class. But essentially, it's it's an arrangement of different orientations. Uh, of gr uh, groupings of orientations of atoms. So they come together to form grain boundaries and that's what you're looking at there. The processing that we might do to a material affects everything at the, the atomic level, but even up to a, a little bit more macroscopic level, you have like a one millimeter scale bar on that image. The, the, the next um, facet that we want to focus on after structure is the properties, right? So the processing influences the structure and the structure influences the properties. So you could think of properties very simply as something like the, the yield point or the modulus or uh, something like that. And, and some properties are going to be more easy to tune and easy to control than others. For example, modulus uh, is not something that we can easily control. It's pretty much dictated by the, the, the material that we choose. Whereas something like um, yield strength or ultimate strength or ductility, those are things that we can control uh, significantly with the processing. So that's, that's, that's one component. The other image I'm showing you here on the far right, this is just a, a, a typical fatigue curve. So you have stress on the, the um, uh, y-axis and number of cycles on the, the x-axis. So this is showing you differences in materials of their fatigue behavior. And we can use processing to change the structure to change uh, uh, the fatigue behavior of the material. And then finally, once we have uh, the properties that we want, we can apply them in some sort of a, uh, an application. So we can look at the performance, whether it's gears, like I'm showing you on the left, or on the right, I'm showing you a, uh, the, the, a hot stage blade of a gas turbine engine. Um, so those are, that's sort of the, the, the way that we think in material sciences. Processing affects structure, structure affects properties, and properties affect performance. And that's what we're going to focus on in this class. But I would say, too, that as you enter this class, uh, I want you to be aware of uh, some differences from, from previous classes. So um, in your previous courses, this is maybe taken from a mechanics of materials course, you were given some shape, some material properties, some load scenario, and then you were asked something like, what's the maximum stress or strain, or what's the deflection that's achieved under a particular force? Okay, so that that's, that's a, a very valuable engineering skill to have. That isn't the focus of this course, okay? In this course, we're gonna say, given some material composition and processing, what are the material properties? And then, and then beyond that, how might we change them for our, for our purposes? Um, and so what I'm showing you here, and, and I don't expect you to have seen this before, on the left-hand side, this is what's called a phase diagram. We're going to spend a long time working with these. You're going to become very familiar. This is the iron carbon phase diagram. So uh, we're, going to, we're going to talk about how we can use these kinds of um, uh, this kind of information to understand a little bit about uh, how to tune the microstructure and then ultimately the properties uh, of something like steel. Uh, again, I'm just showing you here a grain structure of, of steel. Uh, and, and the focus of this class is how are we going to be able to change those? All of that, in, at least as far as this problem above is concerned, is to say, well, 
we could change the elastic modulus because we are going to potentially change the atomic arrangement. Um, we could also change if we were actually trying to solve for something like strength, we could change the strength, we could change the ductility, we could, so in the problem above with the, this um, uh, simply supported beam, we could, we could focus on something like how could we uh, prevent failure or, or make the, make the uh, part more robust. So, so our focus though is going to be on how can we change those material properties. And it's going to be a little bit less quantitative than you're probably used to. So um, we're going to talk about what happens and why it changes the properties, but it's, it's not going to be a um, memorize the method and then apply it in different scenarios. It's going to be conceptual, trying to understand what is it that makes materials behave the way that they do. Okay. So the, I would say that if I want to really boil it down, there are two fundamental questions that we're going to ask um, in this class. The first is how does microstructure affect properties? So this is going to, this is going to take the form of questions like the following. Why is the yield strength of steel higher than pure iron? Maybe you didn't know that, but that is the case. What is it about steel that makes it different? Um, in fact, what does what what is a, what allows the material to yield anyway? We're going to talk about that. Um, another question that might be along these same lines: Why do we oftentimes see alloys being used more often than pure metals? What is that What is that doing for us? Uh, we're going to talk about that in this class. And then something that maybe you've never thought of, why is it that glass shatters and copper bends? You know, uh, ceramics in general, glass in particular, has a very high strength. Uh, so why is it that we don't build um, bridges out of glass? And would you feel comfortable uh, driving over one? I surely wouldn't. Um, so, so we want to ask questions about what is it about their... Uh, what is it about their structure that gives them properties that make them suitable for some purposes and not others? Um, another simple one. Why are rubber materials uh, lighter and more ductile than metals? You know, it, I think everybody knows the, that, uh, that they are, right? I would say all of these, for the most part, people realize that they are, but I don't think very many people can tell you why. We're going to be able to do that by the, by the end of this class. Okay, so that, that one, the one fundamental question that we'll be asking throughout the class is how does microstructure affect properties? And we'll look at microstructures that range from atomic arrangements all the way up to a lot more large-scale microstructural features. Um, the second question is how does processing affect microstructure? So those are that's really where we're going to hone in on. So for example, just a couple brief questions. Why is it that we quench steels after we heat them up? What is it that we're doing to them? How does that processing affect the microstructure? And then finally, uh, why, why would be, we expect or see the grains? Again, you don't necessarily know what grains are, but it's a, it's a larger scale feature of the microstructure. Why are they larger in annealed aluminum than heat treated aluminum? Um, we're going to be able to answer those questions, and and of course, uh, in addition, you'll know why one gives you different mechanical properties than the other. So globally, I want you to come away with the idea that we're going to study why materials behave the way that they do, and we're going to ask how we can control that behavior. Okay. All right. So I want to give you uh, a brief overview of categories of materials. So. And I think, again, some of this stuff you know, we're just going to put a little bit of um, sophistication on your knowledge here. So uh, I think you're familiar with metals, ceramics, and polymers. Uh, these are the three really broad classes of materials that are out there. And if I were to show you a picture of a metal, this widget, whatever it is, uh, you would be able to look at it and say, yeah, that's a metal. And and uh, in part, I'm asking you why. How do you know? What, what makes a metal different than a polymer? What makes a polymer different than a ceramic? And, and we also know something about these broad classes of materials have relatively consistent properties. For example, we know that metals are typically strong and ductile, right? Um, uh, and, and we also know that they are high density. Um, if we're talking about thermal conductivity, just leave a fork in a pan, pot of boiling water for a while and grab the end of it, and you'll see that it has high uh, thermal conductivity. Uh, similarly, if if you've ever been shocked before, you know that we, we, of course, run wires with metal because they are also electrically conductive, so it has th high thermal and electrical conductivity. 
looking at it, probably when I first popped this image up, you could tell it was a metal. Why? Because it was opaque and typically metals are optically reflective. So it's a bit shiny, right? How about polymers? Well, they have another uh, sort of set of properties. So here I'm just showing you a nylon, a nylon rope. But in general, when you think of polymers, you probably think of them as weak and relatively ductile. And that's typically the case. That's not to say that we can't make a very brittle polymer. Um, in general, we still can't make a super strong polymer. Uh, maybe uh, I'll just, there's, there's a couple small uh, classes where that might be true. Maybe in things like um, uh, armor and toe straps. But as a general rule, uh, polymers are, are pretty weak. They're typically low density. That's that's what makes them nice to use in a lot of applications. They also have low thermal and electrical conductivity, um, and they're you they, they can vary all over the map in terms of their their optical properties. Right? They could be opaque, um, they could be translucent, or they could be transparent. All right? We we've we've seen things that are uh, like um, polycarbonate or something like that that we can see through. Okay, so. So that's a second class. And our final class is ceramics. Here I'm showing you just a, a couple coffee cups, obviously, that are ceramics. Uh, some things that you probably know about ceramics, they're strong, but they're brittle, right? They snap. They don't bend very well. Uh, they, they typically are high density, but I would call them medium to high density uh, because in general, they don't achieve the density of metals, but they're significantly heavier than, than polymers. And if you're if you're drinking a cup of coffee, uh, the conductivity is of importance to you. Uh, you'd like that to be low, so it has low thermal conductivity, right? So it doesn't burn your fingers. Uh, in contrast to if you're a hiker or something, and you use those ridiculous tin cups for hiking, and you pour a cup of hot coffee in there, and then promptly burn your fingers off. I, I don't understand the, the purpose of that, but nevertheless, uh, we don't typically drink hot drinks out of high conductivity materials. So you know that ceramics don't conduct well. They also don't conduct uh, elec electrically very well. In fact, they, uh, if you look up on a, um, your power poles, you'll see big ceramic uh, uh, insulators on there. And in terms of uh, the optical properties of ceramic, uh, they can they can span the spectrum. So they can be opaque like the coffee cups here, or they can be transparent like your glass windows. Okay, so those are the broad categories of, of uh, materials. We're going to talk about each of them. We're going to spend the bulk of our time on metals since uh, for most engineering applications, they probably are, are the dominant material. But we're going to talk uh, significantly still about polymers and ceramics, both in terms of processing, microstructure, and uh, properties. Okay. I want to just give you a little example to kind of show you the, the, um, the diversity of properties that we have uh, in materials. So what I'm showing you here is the stiffness on the, the Y axis, uh, or you can think of that as the Young's modulus in, in gigapascals. And then on the X axis is giving you density and just showing you that, uh, for the, for materials, we actually have a seven order of magnitude difference in, uh, the Young's modulus. Um, and, and you can see that uh, in general, lower density materials have a lower modulus, but, but not universally so, right? You can have elastomers, which have relatively low modulus and then higher densities. But then we get up into the metals, high densities and high modulus. Uh, ceramics are in this regime. Uh, polymers are in this sort of intermediate regime where they're lower density, but also lower modulus. So I just want to show you that there's a tremendous variability in material properties. And what we want to be able to answer clearly is why is that? And then maybe we could change some of that. So why, why do we see that? And then looking at density, it varies here by four orders of mag magnitude. Why is that? Um, we're going to talk a lot about uh, these things as we move forward in the class, but I just wanted to whet your appetite and give you a little bit of a flavor for, for what you can expect uh, in the class going forward.